This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Hello, Santa Barbara. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here today. Um, can you actually hear me? I seem to have some feedback. OK. Um, so yeah, so if you wonder why I'm actually studying babies, because after all these books about death and dying, I thought I really need to do something happier, something more fun. Um, unfortunately, being a sociologist, we always tend to be attracted to the area where the problems lie. So it's not as happy as it could be. Um, so let me, since most of you who are students in this room are interested in ethics, let me just sort of quickly situate myself compared to ethics. So I'm not an ethicist by training, by profession. I don't have the ethics professional card. Um, um, but I'm a social scientist. So I do research on topics that have very important ethical implications. But I'm not necessarily interested in uh, making any kind of normative decisions about how um, people should behave. What I'm interested in as a social scientist is more in how do, people, how do people actually behave? How do they react? How do they make decisions, in particular in the context of um, healthcare? Um, and so what I will be talking about has definitely ethical implications, but it's, it's not necessarily what I'm uh, mostly focused on. But of course, you can ask me questions about that, um, and then we can have a nice discussion about it. OK, so my talk today will be about a newborn screening. And just to make sure that this works and that we're all on the same page, I want to make uh, clear that we're talking about screening after the baby is born. There's lots of screening that happens in the prenatal uh, period on the fetus, but I will be talking after about screening that happens when the baby is born. And this is an important difference because it changes the context of possibilities in terms of receiving information about a baby. Um, if in the prenatal um, uh, period you can, make a you can make decisions about whether you want to keep the, the, the fetus or not. In the postnatal period, the period that I'm talking about, you're stuck with the baby. It's only a question of what are you going to do depending on the kind of results you are receiving. OK, so where does newborn screening come from? We have been screening babies in this country since about 1963. So this year is the 50th anniversary of the screening programs. Um, and we, screening started with a condition called phenylketonuria, and is better known with its abbreviation as PKU. And if you wanted to build a screening program around any kind of disease, PKU was really the ideal condition to uh, build a screening program around because with this condition, if you identify babies right in the first days after birth, you can introduce certain kinds of dietary modifications and interventions, and then you can offset mental retardation. So basically, with PKU screening, you promised to prevent mental retardation from happening. And so it was an ideal condition to build a screening program around. However, once you actually implemented the screening program in the early 60s, lots of unintended um, and unanticipated problems occurred. There was some confusion about what kind of treatments are available. Did all the babies that seem to be screening positive for PKU actually have the condition? There were some questions about how long should we uh, how should we treat these babies, but also how long should they um, receive treatment. And so in the first decades after PKU screening was instituted, 
largely, by the way, through the um, work of uh, parent health advocates who went and worked on the legislature, so something I'll be talking about in a minute. Um, so in the first decades after newborn screening was implemented, there was a cautious expansion of the screening program across the US. Um, people thought that the lesson that was drawn from PKU was that, OK, it worked for PKU, but we really should know what we're getting into before we're adding conditions to the screen. And so um, this was further exacerbated by the fact that um, screening is a, is a state responsibility. So every state decides which conditions it would be screening for. So by the year 2000, we're making a big jump here. By the year 2000, we get the following map, where every state in the US screens for PKU, congenital hypothyroidism, that's what the CH stands for, and then one or more other conditions. And some states screen up for up to seven conditions. And this was a really aggravating picture for um, screening advocates because it introduced this an element of chance of screening roulette in the screening uh, business. So inevitably, there would be people, babies born in particular states, and they would not have been screened for particular conditions. Uh, but if they had been born in another state, even a neighboring state, they would have had uh, a screen for these conditions, and maybe they could have been prevented. Um, so health screening advocate, advocates were very upset by this kind of geographical um, inequity that the map suggests. And at the, while they were looking for ways to create more uniformity, this technology came um, um, on, on the forefront in the early 1990s, tandem mass spectrometry. And wh what you need to know for the purpose of my story is that what this technology allows you to, to do is it allows you to take a blood sample and screen for as many biochemical values as you want to screen for. And previously, if you wanted to add a condition to the state screen, you would have to create a separate assay. And so it was very time and resource in in intensive to add a new condition to a screen. With this kind of machine, you could just screen for as many biochemical values as you wanted. So to make a long and actually very interesting history um, short, in 2005, the American College of Medical Genetics, which has been tasked with evaluating what conditions uh, uh, states should screen for, recommended that every state screens for 54 conditions. So they recommended that we go from a handful of conditions to 54 conditions. 29 were core conditions. 25 were additional conditions for which you would find information if you screen for the first um, a part. And then you might as well report them out as well. And so what happened then? So next, the March of Dimes and other patient advocacy organizations basically to, went on this great uh, lobbying spree where, where they went from state house to state house and they lobbied legislators to implement these ACMG recommendations. And they were extraordinarily successful. They brought in parents and they testified. And it was very difficult to uh, make an argument against screening. And so in a very short period of time, but 2007, 2009, um, every state in the US um, adopted the ACMG recommendations more or less in the form that a ACMG had recommended it. And so currently, 4 million babies, every baby born in the US, with some very few exceptions, more than 99% of the babies born in the US are screened for 54, about 54 rare genetic conditions. And I want to take a little pause here. Because if you know anything about the US healthcare system, it is very rare that we have anything universal. I mean, if you make it to 65, Medicare kicks in. But before, when you're younger than 65, there's very few health services that are universally available. And here is one of them. We screen almost every baby born in the US, virtually every baby born in the US for rare genetic conditions. It's very exceptional 
in this particular kind of context. And I want to come back to this at the end of my talk, but um, I just want you to, to think about, and think about this is probably raises the standard that, we pro that you need to fulfill in terms of is this program worth it? Um, because it is so exceptional in the US context. Okay, so this is the expansion of newborn screening. So we, 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 in 2005, we have this enormous um, addition of number of conditions in the screening program. So what is interesting about this expansion from a sociological perspective? What is the social relevance of genetic screening? So if you look at the literature in both genetics and social sciences in the last couple of decades, what you find is two camps that sort of have modify their position over time. On the one hand, you have people who are very strong advocates of knowing the genetic blueprint as a way to personalize medicine, as a way to come up with a treatment, a diagnosis that is specific to your genome. Um, and one of these people is Francis Collins, who is the current head of the NIH. Um, so ge genetics as this way to revolutionize medicine, and there's a lot of hype around this. On the other hand, you have social scientists that, that are very concerned that we're going to, once we adopt um, genetic information, once we start on the route to uh, genetic testing, we're going to change everything of the way that social life is organized and think about, turn it into genetic information. So they talk about the genetization of social life, the way we think about race, about gender, about um, all different factors. We'll all think, we, there's, there's a fear that genetics will take over. Now, in the last decade, much of both the hype and the fear that genetics will take over has um, calmed down quite a bit. And it has happened both on the side of genetics and on the side of social scientists. In fact, if you talk to people who are working in the pharmaceutical industry, there's very low expectations that personalized medicines via genetics will be commercially viable, that this will ever be a business model that will uh, catch on. And um, so geneticists, I mean, actually, if you read the New York Times yesterday, um, there was a story about how there's increased testing for rare uh, genetic conditions. But the, all the geneticists quoted in this story were very cautious about raising too many expectations. And so I think there is um, a sort of a, a sense in the genetic community that genetics can do certain things, but it probably isn't the, uh, the, the final word or the final arbiter of disease the way that it has been hyped before. And on the, the same time, social scientists have argued that you know, this influx of genetics, rather than being this, this fearsome entity, it's probably just like one, one element among many others that, that comes into play in terms of the way people think about themselves, the way they make decisions. So if there is any kind of genetization happening, it's probably more in a quantitative sense, in the availability of information, rather than in a qualitative, transformative sense that people had feared. And this kind of conclusion that there's more of a routinization of genetics, it's not us big deal anymore, it's more becoming more normal part of uh, uh, especially clinical medicine, has been confirmed in the study of genetic clinics. So whenever people across the globe have done studies in genetic clinics, and they look at how do the clinicians make decisions based on genetic testing, or how do patients change their life based on genetic information, the conclusion that is being drawn from this research is that it's not the nature of the information that is so critical, whether it's genetic or not, but what really matters is the badness of the disease. If you find out about something like Huntington's disease and it's confirmed through uh, genetic testing, it often has very strong repercussions. People take it very seriously because it's a, it, 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 it is quite deterministic. But if you find something about a drug aversion or about uh, much milder conditions, people take it with a grain of salt or they don't act on it. So it's more the, the, the subjective badness of the condition rather than the nature of the information. So if we are then in an era of more normalization of genetics, what does it mean to have a screening program um, of all these newborns? And the social scientists have, have many takes on this, but there's two that I want to um, lay out here. And these sort of analytical threads that I want to weave through the talk today. So the first one is, does genetic screening produce new social arrangements or is it going to confirm 
older ways of classifying people. So what we mean with that is that, like, for, um, so on the one hand, we have people like the anthropologist Paul Rabinow, who introduced the concept of biosociality, and he said that. You know, once we get inf genetic information about each individual, we're going to have ways that people are going to organize themselves around um, genes. So, for example, to make this very concrete, you know, I think at, as at any university at UC Santa Barbara, there are clubs for people from different ethnicities, from different regions, different sports, different political interests. Well, he predicted that maybe we would also create clubs around our genes. So all the people who have the same genetic profile would band together and would have this, this, this would be their common identity. Um, so this would be a way of, of uh, new social life. And it might even overshadow some of the older ways that we've been thinking about ourselves. But then there are other people like the sociologist Troy Duster, who has been, and I'm sort of character, characterizing his views somewhat because he's much more nuanced than I, will be, than I will be saying it, but he has been saying that once we introduce genetics into debates, for example, of, such as race, this is what most of his examples are about, are about race, we run the risk of bringing a new biological foundation to um, at the topic such as race, and we reify it. We make it much more real than it might really be because we, we seem to be linking race to biological uh, markers, which is renaturalization. And then there are people like the anthropologist Sarah Franklin who have said, well, it can go either way. It depends on the context. So it could be, in some instances, you can actually naturalize things that weren't considered to be natural before by, through genes. Um, or you can actually denaturalize that, you know, the things that are biological, that were considered to be biological, once you bring genes into the picture, they're not, they're not considered to, to be biological anymore. So the question is, what happens in newborn screening? Is this going to lead to a formation of new identities around ge genetic profiles, new ways of thinking about who you are as a self and who you are as a member of a group? Or is this going to be um, a re going to support older ways of cl or classifying yourself. Um, so we think of this as a, as a prompt for classification um, that people have to make sense of. Okay, then the second issue that a sort of second analytical thread that I want to weave through to talk about is it's like, so as you know from the introduction, I'm an ethnographer, so I observe people, I observe doctor-patient interactions. So how can you say anything meaningful through these kind of observational methods? And so what I try to do is I try to bracket the hype and the, and the hopes and the aspirations that come with newborn screening. If you read the biomedical literature, the impression that you get is that newborn screening is really about saving lives, it's about prevention, it's about um, you know, kids that otherwise would, would get all these um, serious consequences and we are going to prevent the onset of disease. So I basically say, let's see what happens. Let's see what, how people act on uh, newborn screening results and let's see how they make sense of it and through the consequences, and um, this should of course be two words, we learn what um, newborn screening is all about. So I'm going to be agnostic about what newborn screening should be doing, and I want to see what it actually does. And through what it does, I learn what kind of an entity, what kind of an object newborn screening really is. So newborn screening, in for where I'm starting, with, it, it gives people a prompt for action, and it's through their actions that we learn what kind of an object newborn screening will be. Okay, so this leads to the research question that I'm interested in, what are the consequences of the expansion of newborn screening, and more importantly, or what do these consequences tell us about the kind of nature of the program screening is? And I'm going to discuss today three kinds of consequences. I'm going to talk about how newborn screening has created a new patient population, and I will refer to this as patients in waiting. And I spent most of my time talking about the patients in waiting. And then I'm going to tell you about the second consequence. I'm going to talk about how newborn screening has revised our understanding of the diseases that we're screening for. We thought there were this kind of diseases, but once we screen an entire population, we come to the realization it's actually a very different kind of disease, or it's much more complicated. It doesn't, it doesn't behave the way we thought it should behave. And then in the last consequences, I'm going to come back to this fundamental question of does newborn screening really save lives or not? All right.
So that's the structure of the talk. So let me tell you a tiny bit about the methodology. Um, this was an ethnographic project, as I already said. I have been observing um, families in a clinic um, where they were brought for metabolic conditions that were picked up in newborn screening. We did this research for three years, and if I say we, it's my um, co-author Mara, Mara Buchbinder and myself. Um, so we followed 75 families over the three-year periods. In some of these, uh, some of these families we saw once or twice. Some of these families we saw 11 times over this three three-year period. So when, we, when they came to the clinic, we were there with them. We audio taped their interactions with the doctor. Um, we observed. We sat in with them. We talked to them before. We talked to them afterwards. We interviewed them in their homes. Uh, and we did follow-up interviews as well. And then we also attended the staff meeting at the end of the day where the clinicians present their cases. We talked to the geneticists and the other staff, and we had access to the medical records. So it's quite a comprehensive overview of these families' lives for this three-year period. And it's a very diverse population. Um, we had um, people working in the fields picking strawberries. We had people um, driving trucks. Um, to movie sets um, with, uh, loaded with strawberries. And then we had actors and directors eating the strawberries that had been picked on the field. So we had a very diverse socioeconomic sample in it. And also very diverse et ethnically, especially uh, large Hispanic population. OK, so there are four possible outcomes of newborn screening. So between 2005 and 2009, California screened 2,105,119 newborns. In the over overwhelming majority, 99.78%, the result was negative. And negative here is a good thing. It means that the child does not have a disease. And there were 4,580 positive cases. And most of those are actually false positives. So that's when you have initial positive result, but you very quickly determine that this is, a, is not a true uh, uh, result, and so that the screen picked up something up that was a false signal. And they were rarely in our study because this was determined before they made it to the clinic. We saw the, we saw the families when they entered the clinic. And then we have the true positives. So these are kids where there's no ambiguity that they actually have one of these rare genetic conditions. And there's no ambiguity because they either are already sick with symptoms and they are in a neonatal intensive care unit or they're in, a, in the hospital somewhere, or they have such a well-known disease and such a clean picture that there's no ambiguity that they actually are diagnosed with the condition. But then we also had the group that I'm going to talk the most about. And this was actually the largest group in our study. These were, peop these were infants that had a positive screening result. So something was out of range. But it wasn't really clear whether they truly had the disease. So there were two kinds of questions that parents and clinicians were struggling with. Does the newborn have the disease? And even if they have the disease, what is this disease? What is the nature of this disease? And those are the patients in waiting. And I will be talking um, about them um, next. OK, so just to, to really make sure that we're all on the, on the same page, the, the, the situation that, I'm, that I want you to imagine is the following situation. Imagine that you, you've just given birth to a baby, usually. Um, and okay, and um, so you know, some of these pregnancies they're expected, some of them are unexpected. So some people really want to have a baby, some people don't want a baby. Some people had an easy pregnancy, some people had a difficult pregnancy. But anyway, just tons of different trajectories. But now you have the baby, and you had to have this newborn screen. Somebody took a little bit of blood from the heel, put dotted on a piece of paper. A piece of paper was sent to the laboratory. And then you're being informed, you're called into the clinic, and the doctor says to you, the geneticist tells you, there's a positive newborn screen. Remember, you're holding your baby, your newborn baby. It looks like a newborn. You're holding your newborn baby. And the doctor tells you, there's a positive newborn screen. It's either something very serious, something life-threatening, something um, with very serious health consequences, or it's nothing. 
it's a biochemical artifact, it's clinically insignificant, and we don't really know what it is. So that is the situation that I'm talking about. So how, how does this really work? So in our study, there were, from the 75 families, there were about 42 families that were in this particular situation. And I want to emphasize that this doesn't really correspond to particular kinds of conditions. This go crosses a lot of different conditions. It's not specific to uh, conditions. Um, so these parents received contradictory messages, and they often begin with the very first communication of the, from the state's newborn screening program calling up the parents um, and telling them that there is uh, this positive result. And for all the families in our study, the new that their child had a positive newborn screen came as a great shock. Because except in the District of Columbia, no state requires informed consent for newborn screening. So the, all these kids have been screened without informed consent. So most of the parents were at only a vague recollection that there was even a, that the screen even had ha happened. They may have received the brochure, but it was part of the checkout procedures of the hospital. So they didn't leave a lot of a big uh, uh, impression on them. And so in this first conversation, the program usually tries not to scare them too much. Um, so parents of a child with MCAD, a condition that I will be talking a lot about today, um, they were told that the initial levels probably indicated a false positive. However, in the same conversation, they were told you have to retest immediately. We want you to go to, to the hospital today to retest. And they also were told to take some preventive measures. So um, when we talked to families, they re reported that they felt devastated, surprised and shocked, freaked out, scared. They referred to the initial phone call as horrible, giving the new mom a heart attack. My nurse were shot, very nerve wracking, didn't know what to think. So then the con contradiction between not panicking but still taking the condition very seriously is, wa is widened when parents go and talk um, to their pediatrician. And in almost all the cases that we studied, none of the pediatricians had any additional information about these conditions because they're very rare genetic conditions. So what do the parents do? They do the same thing as many of you are doing. They Google. They go online. And what they find is they find the worst case scenarios. They find um, all the horror stories of kids that are symptomatic um, and that have all the negative health uh, uh, consequences. So here is a mother in an interview who, who tells us what she found online. So and actually the first time that they had suggested that he might have PKU, um, you go back to read the material and it's like a blur. So she's referring to the material she got in the hospital. Basically it says we test for this. PKU is this and basically in a nutshell, because of a deficiency in an enzyme, your child can become mentally retarded. So I'm like, what? And then you go on the internet, and it's like, if the levels are like this, you know he'll become retarded. He's losing IQ points by the second. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm looking at him and like, he seems fine. Is his brain, you know, getting destroyed by the protein that's in my breast milk? So. In addition to the horror stories, to further exacerbate the situation, most of the symptoms that may indicate the beginning of a problem remain rather vague and nonspecific. In fact, they include symptoms that almost every baby undergoes, such as some muscle weakness, deep sleep, vomiting, diarrhea, or, and this is the most ambiguous one, not meeting developmental milestones. To make matters even more ambiguous, the, the deterioration can occur without advanced warnings. Thus, any bout of vomiting may signify the onset of irreversible damage, and parents will find online that the first sign of MCAT is often sudden death. So, you know, remember, you're holding your baby here, and this is, this is the kind of things that you're finding online. So what happens next? Um, the, the, there is retesting. 
But in these, in these cases of patients in waiting, even the repeat testing remains ambiguous. There are some signs that still suggest the possibility that something is out of normal range, but they're not convincing enough to be really confident that this is disease. And so then the, the parents visit the metabolic clinic. And there they enter as a very highly anxious um, audience and very captive, really waiting for a solution from this specialist, the geneticist. But what they get there is a continuation of ambivalent messages. Because the follow-up up tests don't exclude the possibility that something is wrong, but the results are typically not serious enough to indicate clear-cut disease. Thus, in, in the meetings, geneticists will repeatedly impress on the parents their hunch that the disease is probably nothing, the results are nothing to worry about, but at the same time, the parents fail to receive clear answers that their, uh, that their child is healthy or that there's, that there's actually really nothing to worry about. So here's an example of our field notes of the first visit between a, a, a foster mother and a geneticist about a daughter who had elevated, elevated levels of prolinemia, proline, which is called hyperprolinemia. So when the geneticist talks to the mother, he, for, to the foster mother, he states, from my perspective, it is quite reassuring. First of all, prone levels are high, but they're not super high. He explains that hyperprolinemia comes into two variants. The first one is simply a biochemical finding. It's a random finding, no symptoms, nothing. He adds that if it wasn't for newborn screening, we probably would never have found out about it. But then he qualifies that the level, that the difference between type one and type two is not just dependent on elevated levels, but also on the different genes. So he says, tells the mother, the ultimate way of figuring this out would be to test the genes. Those tests, however, are not available for clinical purposes. They're only available on research basis. So the foster mother asks when any symptoms could appear, and the geneticist answers that they should appear within the first year of life. But when the foster mother presses him and says, could they appear later, the geneticist admits they could. We don't know. I can't guarantee anything. But the fact that she's developmentally perfectly on target is a good sign. And the foster mother asks about warning signs besides seizures. And the physician explains that they should be attuned to regular developmental landmarks, such as sitting, babbling, and walking in time. So as this geneticist explains to the foster mother, little is known about this condition because few children with this condition came to medical attention uh, prior to newborn screening. And most of the symptoms are nonspecific um, and they rest on vague indicators such as these developmental milestones that I mentioned before. Um, and what was really interesting is that we saw the geneticist presenting his case later in the evening to the staff. Um, and there was a really heated discussion, discussion among the geneticists about a very fundamental issue, whether or not uh, hyperprolinemia is a true disease that required any kind of action. So here you can see that it's not only the question, does the child have the disease, but what is the disease that is at stake? So in spite of um, the diagnostic ambiguity surrounding these conditions, the positive screening results start to take on a life of their own. They receive tractions in the way that families organize themselves. Um, so, and they also become part of repeated interactions with the healthcare providers. Um, and even if repeat testing remains inconclusive, it does not dispel the possibility that something might be wrong with the child. And so the diagnostic procedures of retesting and retesting, it sort of confirms that something might still be awry. And they, they also create a trace of paperwork that requires insurance reimbursement that also gives this disease a or this possibility of disease, a an, an, an particular reality that goes beyond its hypothetical nature. 
Um, so the geneticist will also prepare an emergency letter for the parents to take with them whenever they, they travel and to present to healthcare providers in case of an emergency. And so all parents start to organize themselves around the possibility that their child really has this kind of condition. Um, and all the precautions that they take help settle the condition as a real disease in the lives of many parents of these patients um, in waiting. So let me give you uh, an example of that. And I'll come back to this, the case of the foster mother and the hyperproanemia patient that I described earlier. There, the disorder gained currency as a means to access educational services as part of disability assessment and in the adoption family reconciliation process. So here's again from our field notes. This is at the second visit, which is about six months later than the first visit that I started off with. So then the foster mother reviews developmental steps with the possibility of hyperprolemia. When, telling, when talking about her daughter's difficulty transitioning to solid food, the mother um, reflects, we were not sure whether it was simply a delay where it would soon happen or there was something going on on the inside. So she's, referring to hyperprolinemia. She had the girl tested at a service center focusing on developmental disabilities, and she was diagnosed as being one to two months behind in her motor development and qualified for physical and occupational therapy, again due to hyperprolinemia. The quote unquote diagnosis of hyperprolinemia also had consequences in the adoption process. Social services intervened because the families were generally neglected. There were a whole series of issues that were going really badly in the, in the, in the birth family. But from all the issues that the court could focus in on, the judge focused specifically on the fact that the children were malnourished and the fact that the birth mother had not followed up on the positive newborn screening results. <coughs> So in order to show that she was a fit mother, the foster mother had to take hyperprolemia seriously and document this. So all these actions start to settle the condition of hyperprolemia in the lives of these parents. Um, and they, they provide resistance against a biological redefinition of the condition as benign based on uh, additional test results. So how does this end? There's no really a conclusive ending. It's more of a fading away. Um, from the genetic team's perspective, um, you know, they have exhausted all the follow-up tests, and they have agreed that the condition is unlikely to be serious. And by the time this point is reached, the child is at least one year old and has remained asymptomatic for that year. Um, but the, the, the doctor is still reluctant to say that the, the child is disease free. One geneticist that we observed told um, a parent that he's not, oh, about, a, oh, about a boy, he's not sick, but he's not normal, which must be the ultimate contradictory message to get as a parent. Um, and even if the child is discharged from the practice, the, 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 the geneticist will still leave the door open that um, um, parents might uh, come back for if complications occur. And so the way that parents interpret the situation is completely the opposite. So they also see that the patient, that their, that their infant, that their child has been doing well, but they ascribe him or her doing well because of all the preventive steps they have been taking. So they have been uh, waking up the child in the night for extra feedings, they have been distributed copies of the emergency letter, they provided nutritional supplements, they've avoided certain foods, or they've closely monitored the child for developmental delays. And all these preventive practices are the reason why the child is doing well. So what's very paradoxical is that at the end, some of the doctors were willing to let go of the diagnosis, but some of the parents held on to it. And we had some exceptions. There were some Spanish-speaking families that might not have gotten the, the correct information the first time. And there was one family in our study where the father was very suspicious that the doctors were experimenting, and they basically dropped out of this. But almost all the rest went along with it. So this was the first consequence that I want to talk about. Um, newborn screening creates this new population of patients in waiting. Without newborn screening, we wouldn't know they exist, but they're sort of kept in limbo between being a false positive and a true positive. There is a sign, but we don't really know what its clinical relevance is. <coughs> so now let me talk about the second consequence, and I'll do this uh, in, in a shorter time period. 
So while we are treating baby by baby and case by case, there's also a collective learning process going on about the diseases themselves. And um, so what's that, what's that all about? So prior to newborn screening, clinicians gathered knowledge about rare metabolic conditions from symptomatic patients. Often these patients developed a serious complication before a diagnosis was even possible. So any diagnostical criteria, any uh, biochemical test, any treatment protocols, any incidence figures, if they were available at all, were all based on these symptomatic patients. Once you screen a full population, what you learn is that your, your initial uh, sample or your understanding of the disease was very biased. Um, because uh, once you screen a population, like a, to a newborn screening program, you're going to identify asymptomatic patients. And to some extent, that's what you want. You want to get these patients before they develop disease. But when the number of patients that you identify keeps rising and rising, and it's much more than you anticipated uh, identifying, then you become suspicious that maybe not all of these patients have the same disease as your symptomatic patients. And that calls into question every aspect of the knowledge base that you had gathered before, all the treatment protocols. Maybe these patients don't really need the same treatment than your symptomatic patients that you knew before. So let me illustrate this with the condition called MCAT that I was referring to. And this is not the test that you take to get into medical school, but it stands for medium chain ACLCOA dehydrogenase deficiency. But luckily, people refer to it as MCAT. Um, it was first identified in 1982. Um, and what these patients have, lack, and this is the knowledge base before 90, um, no, sorry, before newborn screening was instituted, before 2005, is that they lack an enzyme needed to process stored fat into energy. Consequently, the body may sustain a metabolic crisis when glucose supplies are depleted and fatty acids may accumulate in the blood. And according to the prevailing wisdom prior to newborn screening, MCAT occurs due to a founder effect, especially in people of non-Hispanic white uh, origins from European uh, countries. And if these patients fast, they may, go, may fall into shock and die. So how did newborn screening change the knowledge that we have about MCAT? So in the recent past, patients, so prior to newborn screening, patients identified with MCAT exhibited clinical signs and symptoms clinical signs and symptoms, which were then confirmed by biochemical testing. And because you had already symptomatic patients and then you had the biochemical values that were out of normal range, you had sufficient information to make a diagnosis. Occasionally, a geneticist would do a mutation analysis for a specific panel of genes and in order to, make, to be more sure about the kind of uh, MCAT it was, but most of these patients would have two mutations, one of two mutations. So there will be two uh, uh, mutations that uh, um, were associated with MCAT. And, and the genetic analysis didn't really change the treatment protocol by any uh, measure. So MCAT was a disease in which symptoms, biochemical levels, genes neatly aligned. You knew, I mean, if you, knew, you had the one, you knew what the other two would be as well. Now, if you do newborn screening, you don't enter the disease anymore on the symptomatic level. You enter on the middle level. You enter on the biochemical values. Um, and so in our study, most of the newborn screenings were completely asymptomatic. I mean, sorry, most of the MCAT patients were completely asymptomatic. They ate, smiled, slept, and kept their parents up just like any other baby. But the only indication that they could have MCAT was an elevated C8 acyl carnitine level, which is the biomarker at the time, considered at the time the most indicative of, of MCAT. But the crucial question for uh, geneticists and parents was whether abnormal biochemical levels still indicated disease. And so in this case, uh, geneticists fell back on a uh, genetic mutation analysis to identify whether the child truly had the disease or not. And this worked if the child came up with one of the two commonly known genes, but what happened more often was that there were many more mutations available, and then the, 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 um, the geneticists were again in the dark. They didn't know how to interpret the results, and they didn't know uh, whether 
these kind of MCAT patients were the same as the patients they had before. So here is a geneticist explaining this to a family in which this situation occurred. So she says, newborn screening has opened up a whole new era of research on the molecular basis of this condition because now the original test just measures the fats, right? So now we're finding that we cannot sometimes just diagnose the conditions just based on that. So the fats refer to the metabolic levels. So we have to go to the DNA test, which is what we did in your case. And when we do that, we find all sorts of new mutations that have never been seen before because the cases are probably milder, and so we never saw them before. So newborn screening um, misaligns, segregates the, the symptoms from the metabolic levels and the genetics from the, meta, from the, uh, sorry, from the biochemical levels. So what was neatly aligned prior to newborn screening becomes disconnected. and. MCAT doesn't end, is a very, becomes a very different entity. You still have certain values, bio, certain biochemical values, but you don't know whether this is the same MCAT that you have been seeing before. Um, so, and as I already hinted at, not, it's not only diagnosis that changes through to newborn screening, but also the incidence changes. Uh, the severity, some clinicians, although it's still controversial, now start to distinguish milder forms of MCAT with more serious forms of LCAT, MCAT. And the populations have changed. We thought that this was an exclusively European um, condition. In fact, we now have MCAT variants among Asian populations and among um, Latin American Latino populations. So, um, so what we see is once you introduce a screening program, you're going to this collective learning process that crosses patient trajectories about the nature of the disease. You thought it was this kind of an entity, but it's very, very different once you screen this large population for it. And so consequently, some of these conditions get completely redefined. So uh, people are shedding cutoff points, shifting cutoff points. That happened in the case of hyperprolinemia. It, the, the levels are now so high that it's virtually impossible to qualify for hyperprolinemia. Some of these diseases are split up into, like PKU is also split up in hyperfe. There's a milder condition called hyperfe, which doesn't require the same treatments as PKU. Or the disease is de degraded completely. People don't really think that this is an actual disease, but it's more like a biochemical variant with, uh, of clinical insignificance. So the second consequence is that through newborn screening, we have to revise our understanding of these diseases that we're screening for. OK, let me go to the third uh, consequence here. So the third consequence is this very basic question. Does newborn screening save lives? And to really answer this question, you need to do an epidemiological study with control groups, and you need to, um, um, you know, you need a very different methodology than the one that I've been using. Um, but there are some things that you can conclude from our study about how newborn screening could save lives if it does. And I want to make clear, especially since it's being taped, that um, there is no doubt about it that newborn screening saves some lives. There's absolutely no doubt about that. There are people walking around now who wouldn't be walking around due to newborn screening. There's also no doubt about that newborn screening identifies a lot of babies with conditions um, and whether all of these babies are saved, that is still, uh, at this point, a bit of an unsettled question. Maybe some of these babies are identified without, um, you know, that they would be fine either way. But OK, so if we come to this question of how does newborn screening save lives, so there's three points I want to make. First of all, it's going to depend really on the condition that you have. The window of opportunity is going to be more narrow or broader depending on the condition you're screening for. We're screening for certain conditions that even if you know in the first days of life that the baby has the condition, there's very little you can do in terms of, of treatment. There's very little treatment available. I mean, in other conditions, even if you, if you have some treatment, it might not save the baby or it might not offset um, some of these uh, very serious complications. So, so the, the stack of life saving, the cards of life saving is stacked differently for each one of the conditions that we're screening for. But that's not the only part. So even if we're going for the more um, um, positive cases in terms of our potential for saving lives, um, there's, there's a lot of the, there's a lot of unarticulated work that needs to be performed for newborn screening to save lives. So 
Um, it's not, once you provide somebody with information at the beginning of life, in order to take advantage, a lot of elements need to fall into place. And this became very clear to us when um, we were uh, when we were when we were attending a clinic meeting where a mother of a child with MCAT was telling a very scary episode. And from in our study, this was the clearest case where newborn screening probably saved a life. Um, this was an, an MCAT patient who was diagnosed abroad, was now living in the US, and um, at, a couple of years ago, this child fell sick with swine flu, H1N1 uh, virus. And as you know from what I've told you before, if these kids fast, and, and because of the flu they would be fasting, they're in grave, grave danger and they're, because their body cannot um, uh, nourish itself. Um, so the mother was in this, in this particular visit, the mother was telling of how her child got the, came down with the swine flu. She rushed her daughter to the, the emergency department. Um, they put an IV in her with glucose and she very quickly stabilized. And so here this quote is how the doctor reacts to her. So he's very blasé about it. He's a very geneticist who's talking to the mom. He's sort of saying, you know, the most important thing is when they get sick. Get them to the hospital. Make sure that they're eating. If they eat, they're protected. Although people talk about low-fat diets, talk about carnitine, the essential treatment is just not letting them become ill. With this condition, it's easy to treat so that unless you live in the middle of nowhere, and here the mother interrupts him, and she's livid. She yells at him, she says, or getting to the emergency room, or have a doctor that will take you seriously, or have a rapid onset disorder. You make it sound like it's so easy, like all you do is get them to the ER. So much happens before they get sick and before you get to an IV drip. So what the mother is angry about is that the doctor downplays all this really critical work that she did in order to save the baby's life. So newborn screening may save lives, but the, 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 the ability to save lives depends on a lot of work that is largely invisible, largely unaccountable, but it's really critical for newborn screening to save lives. And most of that work is being done by um, um, mothers. Um, so the second point is we need to have an infrastructure and a set of opportunities in order to save lives. But I don't want to leave you with an impression that saving lives in uh, newborn screening is just a matter of um, uh, mothers doing a ju good job because there are lots of other barriers in place that can erode the life-saving potential of newborn screening. And this is where I come back to where I started off earlier. The fact that this is one of the very few universal health services, public health health services that are available to everyone in this country. So it's true that almost all babies are being screened for these rare genetic conditions, but the universality stops at screening. So the moment you need treatment, you enter the healthcare system. And then all the barriers that we are familiar with, all these problems in terms of the healthcare system, they start gradually eroding the life-saving potential of newborn screening. So we might know at birth that the child is very ill, but whether people can act on this information is to some sense limited by the healthcare system. And so there are differences in insurance, for example, between private and public insurance. If you have, public insu if you have private insurance, you might have to go to an HMO and be on the phone calling, um, the variety of people and the nurse needs to be on the phone and the doctor eventually needs to be on the phone in order to get um, reimbursement. Co-payments can be a, a problem. Um, medical food, many of these metabolic conditions, you need special uh, nutri nutritionary uh, supplements. Um, they are not considered pharmaceutical, so they're not being um, reimbursed by uh, many health, uh, health insurance companies. And again, you need authorization for it. Some families give up, some families pay out of pocket because, um, they, uh, uh, because they're being denied by their insurance company. Um, therapeutic services, um, California has a very, or relatively generous um, early start program, but it's only available till age three. So, um, it doesn't depend on how whether the child needs more services, 
uh, or less services, it's, you age out of it at age three. And then you can go to the school system or you can go to the regional services, but they have much more stringent criteria for uh, these developmental services. Transportation can be a problem. Uh, our clinic met only one afternoon a week. For some people, for some uh, poor people, the ca or, or for, for even working people, just the fact that you have to take off one afternoon a, um, a month to go to the clinic can be a major issue. Language barriers, um, if your doctor is not native Spanish speaker and you're a Spanish uh, patient, uh, the difference is, is, is uh, really mind blowing in terms of what they can uh, get out of this. All right, so the third, the, the third consequence is in terms of life saving, Newborn screening probably saves lives, but there's a lot of other elements that need to fall into place to take advantage of this uh, life-saving potential. So to wrap this all up, I've pointed to three consequences of genetic screening, three consequences of this newborn screening program. We have a new set of patient populations that we wouldn't have without the screening program. People are sort of kept in limbo between a false positive and a true positive. There is a, something out of range for them, but it's not really clear whether these people are really diseased. But they're still kept under medical surveillance and people and families adapt at the possibility of disease. Then we have a new understanding of diseases. We thought MCAT was this kind of an entity. Once we screen the entire population, it's very different. It's a very different kind of uh, condition. And then we have these system-wide infrastructural problems that are rearing up their heads and that are gradually eroding the life-saving potential of um, a, a screening program. So what we see is, what we observe in our study is how families and clinicians are trying to make this program work, trying to make sense um, collectively and interactionally, uh, working out of the, the biological and the social parameters uh, properties of these genetic anomalies under conditions of diagnostic uncertainty. And this is an ongoing experiment, and this is very much a learning curve. Our study captures the beginning of when these conditions were for in the first years that they were being introduced. And we see already after three years that people are, are getting more used to these conditions, to, to some of these questions that baffled them at the beginning. But at the same time, more conditions are being added every year to the screen because it's so easy to do with this tandem mass spectrometry. So to come back to one of the questions I had, this is one of these analytical threats. Does, new, does a genetic screening program, does a genetic testing program um, create new ways of categorizing people? Of course, I explained that to you with, um, with um, the patients in waiting. But there are also reinforcement of some of the older categories of the way we deal with health and illness. One of the findings that I showed you was that you know, it's largely a, a task of women to take care of mothers and specifically to take care of these uh, um, children with chronic conditions. And this is a very common finding across lots of medical sociology studies. We also have other ways that um, newborn screening affects people that are not necessarily related to genetics, but are related to other uh, factors, such as uh, levels of anxiety, ac actual disorder that people have. The kind of preventive steps that they can take uh, creates different ways of grouping people language barriers, previous experience with disability, the communication style with doctors might also um, um, structure that experience, and even transportation, this distance to the, the um, clinic. So as a final thought, I would like to leave you with this. That the social significance of uh, getting a diagnosis, and that's really what newborn screening is about, getting a diagnosis to prevent the onset of disease. The social significance of a diagnosis has always been its functionality. With a diagnosis, we have the ability to structure medical encounters, we institute health policies based on diagnosis, we shape life strategies, we even use that to control deviance. In the case of newborn screening, however, the social significance of diagnosis, uh, of, of, um, a diagnosis has now been extended to those living between health and disease. Thank you.